Let's pray. Jesus, please come with your presence today and open our minds to what you have to say to us. And we thank you that you do speak to us. You love us. You care for us. You commune with us. Please do so this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So just a reminder in that I haven't been in the pulpit for four weeks. We are in the midst of a Bible reading plan for the year. And believe it or not, we're, we're moving in on halfway through. I believe this next week is week 20. Um, and I've been producing the Bible study guides. I think they're available right now through uh, number 23, week 23. We're encouraging you to go deep in Jesus. Spend time going through the harmony of the Gospels, all four Gospels in a single narrative. Um, and then if you add to that, if you're only going to do one of the reading plans, do that one. <clears throat> we also have the chronological Bible reading plan. We're up into the life of David and uh, going through the entire scriptures. And if you still want to get involved, you can jump in anywhere, and hop on the bus, so to speak. Um, just give me a... Uh, text or an email and I'll get you that information. Now, last time, four weeks ago, I'm sure all of you recall in detail that uh, we talked about how to read the Bible better and I gave you five, six or seven different study aids, books you can purchase that can help you have tools of the trade so that you can understand time and place and culture and uh, Help the Bible make more sense as you read through it. Because remember, it's you know several millennia of time difference. It's completely different language setting, especially with Hebrew. And language and culture are very closely tied together. And we think everybody ought to live just like we do and think like we do. But guess what? They don't and they haven't. So I gave you some items there that you can pick up. I suggested you invest a few dollars in the tools of the trade of reading scripture and knowing scripture. And then I closed last time by saying the next time around I would tell you about the very best, absolutely best Bible study help and aid that is available and it's available absolutely free. And that was kind of my carrot. I see you all came back today just waiting for that, right? Um, I know that's why you came this morning when you got up. You thought he's going to talk about that today. Well, actually, I'm going to put you off a week. Until next week. Because this is Mother's Day weekend. And I did some thinking this week. I'd like to talk today about a biblical worldview of the whole subject of girls, women, and mothers. Up until about 10 years ago or so, a lot of things have been universally understood since the beginning of time that have suddenly been challenged. I mean, there's been no question that female babies become girls who become women who, in most cases, become moms. And by the way, that's the only pathhood to motherhood that um, is even possible, no matter what your philosophy is. I want to look at a world, kind of, how do we look at womanhood, motherhood from a biblical worldview, not a secular, evolutionary, current societal worldview. And in the process, we're going to have to contrast boyhood, manhood, and fatherhood. And in that we never get a Father's Day sermon because that's always the second week in a camp meeting, we may bring a little of that in here. I'm going to try to move quickly so that this does not become a series. Any biblical worldview begins with this Bible verse. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Any biblical worldview begins with the acknowledgement that everything that, was, that is was made by God. Amen? God made it. It didn't evolve from nothing. Nothing didn't blow up and become everything. It's not here because it's an accident. Nothing is here because of blind, random, non-intelligent forces. From a biblical worldview, everything in this world is the result of God's intelligent, miraculous design. Everything in the original creation was intentional, designed, and created very good. 
Now, we probably want to get around today to talking about what went wrong, but we want to talk about how God made things right in the beginning. A Christian biblical worldview, I suppose maybe is contrasted to a Jewish biblical worldview, and they should pretty much sink, has to add this verse in the beginning. Was the word, speaking of Jesus, and the word was with God and the word was God, he... Jesus, the incarnate Son of God, was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Not only do we believe that God created everything, we believe that Jesus is the God who created everything. He is life, and the only life that anything has on this world comes from God, and it comes from God who is Jesus, who is God. You got that? Not going to argue for its correctness today. I believe it. I'm going to sim simply sharing with you a biblical worldview. Paul affirms this, the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ. Remember, we believe in the three who are one who is three, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We don't have three gods because if you know one, you know all three. You don't have to get acquainted with one and then get acquainted with the next. Get acquainted with the third one. If you get one, you get them all. And if you pray to one, somebody, the other one isn't going to be dissed because you didn't mention them. They don't have any of those kind of problems. Talk to God, talk to Jesus, talk to the Spirit. If you get one, you get them all. Amen? So God creates all things through Jesus. Jesus is God who created all things. How do we say it? We can say it so many different ways. Paul says this, for by him all things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible and invisible. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things in the beginning and in him all things consist. So Jesus is the creator God who made all things both in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. And without him, there is no life, there is nothing. He not only made them, made us, we exist in him. He sustains, they consist in him. All right? So a biblical worldview categorically rejects long ages of evolution, categorically rejects the idea that somehow a death cycle evolved into what we have today. It begins with a God who made the world in seven days, and he made it good, very good, and everything that is even corrupted in this world today started as a perfect creation of God. Amen? All right, that was a pretty flimsy amen. <laughs> Jumping to the subject of humanity, then God said, let us make Adam. Now, I'm going to use the word Adam where it's in the Hebrew as Adam. All the, word, all the times you run into the word man in Genesis 1 and 2, with the exception of a couple spots I'll show you, it is the word Adam. We are the Adam species. Adam is not just the name of the first guy. It's our species name. All through the Old Testament, when it talks about mankind or humankind, it uses the word Adam. All right? So we are Adam, and he was Adam. Got that? Women, men, boys, girls, husbands, wives, fathers, and mothers. We are all Adam. All right? God said, let us make Adam in our image, according to our likeness, and let them. I want you to notice right off the bat, Adam is a them. Not just a him or a her, but a them. Let them. Adam, let us make Adam, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, birds of the air, over the cattle, over the earth, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created Adam in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. Then God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. I want to make some points out of this verse in terms of a biblical worldview, first of all, of humanity and then of men and women. First of all, God said, let us make Adam. We 
are hand created by God. We did not evolve from slime. We did not come by accident. We are wanted children that God made for his glory and for his enjoyment in relationship. Amen? I don't see how anyone can believe the rest of the Bible if you don't believe the first 11 chapters. And the first 11 chapters, I say it that way because that involves creation, flood, and the Tower of Babel. Stories which, from a secular worldview, have absolutely no validity or basis. But I don't know how we can believe the rest of the Bible if we don't literally believe the first 11 chapters. I'm a literalist on that. So the first thing we want to look at in the sixth day about the making of humanity, because that's what we want to talk about, because you women are human. Is God said, let us make Adam. We are created creatures designed and built by God, handmade, as we'll see in Genesis 2, verse 7. We're wanted children. We're not oopses. We're not surprises. We're not Johnny-come-latelys. We didn't just show up one day and he took us in. He made humanity. Secondly, he said, let us make Adam in our image, after our likeness or according to our likeness. We are not the highest animal. We are not at the top of the animal chain or tree. We are specially designed creatures in the image of God, which is something that no other creatures on planet Earth are made in. We are supposed to be, we were made to be glorious statues of God walking around on Earth. So often we talk so much about original sin, we never get around to remembering original glory. Before we flopped and fell, before we have been degenerated and um, fallen apart under sin, we were made to be glorious images of God. He says, don't you go making any images of me, but I've made you an image of me. I believe that if somebody from another universe or planet or something who knew God showed up here on earth and saw us, they'd say, you look like your dad. Now, I don't know exactly what that resemblance is because I don't think it's fingers and toes. I think it's much deeper than spiritual, not less, I mean, than physical, not less than physical, but deeper than physical. There is something in the essence of our very nature which reflects God. We're not made to be his pets. We're made to be his kids. He's given us the ability somehow to have the kind of a relationship with him that it's almost like maybe a, a father or mother and adult child relationship. God may be infinitely more than we are, but he made us enough to commune with him almost as equals and friends. Does that make sense? And that's something no other creatures on earth have, and we didn't evolve into this from what they are. God made us the way we are. He made us for communion with him. He gave us the ability to love, not just pair off by instinct, but actually pair off from love. He gave us the ability to love him as he loves us. Therefore, he gave us freedom because if I don't have the choice to not love you, then I can't have the choice to love you. And without choice, there is no such thing as love. There's only programming. And if any, if any of you have discovered, if your computer tells you I love you, it doesn't have any real deep meaning. It's got to be someone who chose to love. I like to tell uh, couples at a wedding, Say to the groom, what you're saying to your bride today is, I could have had any woman in the world, but of all the women in the world, I have chosen you, and vice versa. Does that make sense? It's all about that choice. I believe that all comes down to being made in his image. 
after his likeness. And then it says, I've let them have dominion. We were made to be the kings and queens of this world, not in a, destruct, in a destructive, selfish, overuse approach, but rather as stewards, but in charge. God made some incredible dirt on this planet. I mean, think of all the things we make out of the dirt, the rocks, the ground, the minerals, the stuff. Everything we have just about is because we've discovered you can take dirt and make amazing things out of it. And he didn't necessarily give us a manual on how to do it all. He let us discover it as we went along. And can you imagine the discoveries we have not even come close to that we would have made had we remained perfect? We would have known how to utilize the stuff that God put on planet Earth without abusing planet Earth. And it would have been very, very good. I've seen a bumper sticker over the years. It kind of has an outline picture of some guru on it. It says, uh, the earth was not made for us. We were made for the earth. Well, that's new age and that's pagan. We were made to be in charge of this world, not for the world to be in charge of us. In every pagan religion, the... the in, every false religion, the humans have to plead with the nature gods for the right to live. And it's just exactly the opposite. God put us in charge of nature. Now we've done a terrible job as self selfish, sinful people, but today we're talking about pre-sin. Under sin, the dominion has become destructive, abusive, harmful, but God intended it for it to be very, very good. I want to notice one other thing. It not only says let them have dominion, but it says let them have dominion. I want you to notice that nowhere in Genesis 1 and 2 does God put any image of God creature over any other image of God creature. He doesn't put men in charge of women. He doesn't put women in charge of men. He doesn't set up kings. He doesn't set up any kind of a pecking order. He gives us in our perfect state, dominion over the world. He doesn't give us dominion over each other. Do you get that, guys and ladies? We're always trying to dominate each other, aren't we? Women marry a man because they see a, a bravado, maybe a, an adventure spirit, they see a, a strength, and then they spend the rest of their lives trying to tame that. Have you noticed? And I think, men, we do the same thing to our wives. We keep trying to control each other. The Bible does not put any human being in, it, in the perfect created state in dominion over any other human being. It gives us, them, dominion over the world. All right? Fourth item. God created Adam in his own image, verse 27, in the image of God he created him. Notice he, he mentions again this whole image of God thing before he mentions male and female, he created them. He made two genders and clearly identified them. He didn't make three or 50 or fluid. He made male and female, boys and girls, men and women. And he, in the context of saying that, he repeats that we're made in the image of God, both male and female. I believe males reflect the image of God, and I believe females reflect the image of God. Men reflect the image of God in unique masculine ways, and women, you reflect the image of God differently in unique feminine ways. And there are strengths that men have that are not as strong in women and there are strengths that women have that are not as strong in men. And according to the original plan, men are now a unique species or subspecies within humanity. Women are a unique subspecies. There is no crossover between the two. God made us male and female. That's not popular today, but it's biblical truth if you hold a biblical worldview. God is infinite, holy, and glorious. 
And so he shared part of his image with the male half of humanity and he shared an overlapping but different subset of his infinity with the female half of humanity. Does that make sense? Neither of us reflect image of God any more than the other one. We just reflect it differently. It may be an oversimplification to say that men reflect kind of a strength and leadership role of how God, of who God is in women. I think it definitely fits to say that you reflect the beauty and the mystery of God in a way that us men will never come close. And that frustrates us sometimes. By the way, I think that's why Satan has such a special hatred against women is because he wanted to be the beauty. And God gave you a beauty he can never have. The evil one has no greater aim than to remove the image of God from earth. He hates God and Satan wants to erase God's image from the earthly domain. He wants men to stop being real men. He wants women to stop being real women. He wants to corrupt the meaning of man and woman. He wants to confuse, misconstrue, cancel, and corrupt. He especially does not want godly men and women to get together in this thing called marriage because when those two unique images of God get together, you have an even more glorious representation of the image of God on earth. And Satan hates that. Genesis 5, 1 and 2. This is a book of the genealogy of Adam. In the day that God created Adam, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them. Notice Adam is a them. Male and female. Zakar, Nekabah. And he blessed them and called them Adam. Notice both the male and the female are called Adam. That's our species. It did turn out to be the first guy's name too but we're all Adam. And he blessed them and called them Adam in the day that they were created. So God made us uniquely in his image to have dominion. He gave us co-dominion, not over each other, but over the rest of creation. He designed gender, male and female. And then finally, God said, verse 28, be fruitful and multiply. God made us to multiply. When you get two image of God creatures together, a male and a female, you end up with little glorious image of God bearers coming along. The idea of multiplying biblically, from a biblical worldview, the idea of having children is a blessing, not a problem. You don't find anywhere in the Bible that babies are a problem. Well, there are some problem babies, so let me say that again. You don't find any place that having babies is considered a problem. It's considered a blessing. It's considered a special gift that God, the creator, gave, the image of, gave us image of God creatures to actually create new image of God creatures. And whenever an image of God creature is conceived in the womb of a woman, it's never just a blob of cells. It's never just something that can be gotten rid of. It's always a budding, soon to be growing, God knitting together in the womb image of God creature. It's not something you're supposed to get rid of by sucking out of the womb with a vacuum cleaner and destroying and throwing in a dumpster. Right from conception, the Bible is very clear that God is at work in the womb of a woman. And I would like to suggest it doesn't matter even under the reign of sin, under what circumstances that new image of God creature is conceived in. That has nothing to do with the fact that it is now an image of God creature budding to become a full human being. God intended us to multiply and have that be one of our greatest joys, that we get to be creators and enjoy the fruit of our labor. Maybe that's a double entendre there, the fruit of the womb. So we've made six points. 
We are made by God. We are made in his image. We are given dominion. It is co-dominion, not dominion of humans over humans, but humans over the rest of the earth. He made us male and female. Gender is God's idea. And he made us to multiply. Babies are God's idea, and they're considered a blessing. You can't find anywhere in Scripture anything in Scripture except the idea that in a biblical worldview, girls became young ladies, became women who looked forward to having babies, and they felt cursed if they weren't able to. A whole different view from our modern worldview. Again, we're just talking about a biblical worldview. Satan has tried to overturn every one of these points. He says you revolve from slime. You're just a high animal. You're not a special godlike creature. He says the earth is in charge of us. We're not in charge of the earth. He's got us battling to dominate each other. He's trying to destroy the male-female, dare I call it, binary that God created and confuse our kids from the very dawn of their thinking. And he's tried to turn multiplying into something that we are going to be destroying our own unborn image of God creatures out of self-determination and out of a claim of some kind of freedom. We no longer offer our babies onto the red-hot arms of Moloch to let them roast in honor of those gods. Instead, we sacrifice our babies to careers and self-determination. Genesis 2, verse 7, the Lord God formed Adam of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and Adam became a living being. Adam is the name of our race. God formed Adam. That's a word that is used all through Genesis and other places for God creating something out of nothing. God formed Adam. He formed the human race. It's his divinely designed creation. And then it says, oh, notice Psalm 100 verse 3, know that the Lord, he is God, and he has made us and not we ourselves. That's a truth we have to remember. We did not make ourselves, and we do not make ourselves. It says he formed him of, of the dust of the ground. The word ground in the Hebrew is the word adama. Adama. So he formed Adam out of the Adama. Now in the Hebrew, consonants define a word and the vowels can be all over the place. So you have this guy named Esau, and what was his other name? Edom. Edom is because he was red. Esau was hairy, so he's red hairy. That was his name. Adam Adama is the red dirt, so we're the red dirt people. That's how we are defined biblically. We were made from the Adama, so God called us Adam. We're the red dirt people. And God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Notice the first thing that Adam saw when he opened his eyes was God about this close. Because God breathed life into him. Didn't just speak it like he did the animals. He kissed it into us. He breathed it into us. It says something about the intimacy with which God intends to be close to us. And Adam became a living being, the word nephish. Satan has tried to confuse that, the idea that you have a nephish. No, you are a nephish. The word for soul in Scripture is not something God put in you. It's something you are. Living, breathing human beings are nephish. We're whole beings. We're souls. And once again, Satan has sought to overturn all of this, says we're not a special creation, says God didn't breathe us into life, all these misconceptions of the soul. But a biblical worldview has to start with a concept that we are special handmade creations of God, made male and female. Now, how in the world did the male and female thing come about? And that's where Genesis 2 kicks in in a very special way. 
The Lord said in verse 18, it's not good that the Adam, and by the way, he often puts the definite article. It's not good that the Adam, that would be the species, should be alone. So the thing we learn that we don't see in chapter one, that we see in chapter two, is that when God initially made human beings, he only made one of us. And I'm gonna give you my theory this morning, and I've actually found one Jewish rabbi that agrees with me. So I got backed up a little bit. I believe it's clear that when God first made human beings, he didn't make them male and female, he just made one because he was alone. And that's not good, it's not bad, there wasn't anything bad because everything was very good, but it wasn't finished. So God said, it's not good that the Adam should be alone. I'll make him a helper comparable to him. So out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to the Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever the Adam called each living creature, that was its name. Adam's first job as dominion, as, as ruler of the earth was to name the animals. God didn't tell Adam what to name the animals. He didn't say, now this is of that and that's of that. He said, you get to name them. And so Adam named all the animals. So Adam gave names to all the cattle, the birds, the air, the beasts of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. The old King James says, a help meet. The word help, helper, comes from Ezer. Um, even the biblical names like Ezra, are built on this idea of, of a helper. And you'll find that that word helper in this form is used almost exclusively in scripture for God coming through to help us when we're in a life-threatening situation. This isn't just help with the laundry and cooking the meals. This is life-saving help. Like God helps us when we're in trouble, he was going to give a helper to Adam. And comparable comes from konegdo, which is a preposition added to a word, but it literally means a corresponding or a same opposite. You look at two deer or two mice or, you know, two antelope or two frogs or whatever, and you discover there are two and they only fit with each other, but in, the, in, the ways that the, in some ways they're the same and in some ways they're opposites so that they interlock and fit together, not just physically, but, but emotionally and in human case, spiritually, mentally. So Adam names the animals and he discovers there are two that only fit with each other and they're the same and yet they're opposites. They're same and yet they're different. And God says, I'm gonna make one for him, but first I'm gonna let him discover that what's missing, and then out of that longing, I will bring to him what is my crowning act of creation. And the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall on the Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Adam took his first nap. Sometimes I talk about taking my first nap of the day. Um, I very seldom get a second one, and most of the time I don't get a first one. Adam took his, isn't a nap a wonderful thing? I hated it when I was a kid, now it's a great thing. And God actually put him asleep and did surgery and took one of his ribs. Now, the word rib is used about 40 times in the Bible. Nowhere but in these verses is it ever used to refer to an anatomical body part. Everywhere else it's used for a side. One side of the Ark of the Covenant, the other side. One side of the sanctuary, the other side. One side of the hill or the other side. It's also used for beams, which is maybe where we get the idea of rib. But it's mostly used for a side. So here's my theory. By the way, I actually saw this 
Somebody discussing the differences between men and women said men have one less rib. That is not true. <laughs> We're not missing a rib. I believe it would be better translated like it is everywhere else in the Bible. Sides. God took a side of Adam. Or dare I say God split the Adam. And when the Adam woke up, he wasn't half the man he used to be. Then the side or rib which the Lord had taken from the Adam, he made into a woman and brought her to the Adam. Let's give that a little more literal translation. The Lord God built. It's the same word used in scripture for building a house, um, building something. The Lord built the rib or the side, I'm going to go with side, which he took from the Adam into woman and he brought her to the Adam. I found interesting here is God formed Adam, that's the word Yatsar, which has to do with making something from nothing. But it says when he made woman out of the side of Adam or the Adam, he built her. And that's having to do with building something out of materials on hand. Now here's what I believe. I don't believe that Adam before the split was a he, she, or a newt, or whatever. That is not even on the table yet. There is no gender yet. God put all of the image of God that he was gonna put in humanity in one being. Then he split that being in two and made two unique out of the one because what's his ne the next thing he's gonna do? He's gonna bring the two and make them one again. Do you get that? Now what would happen if you tried to split a human being into two? You make a mess. What happens when we try to bring two into one? Generally, we make a mess. But God can. God can take the one and split the one into two that are now sexually differentiated, same opposites, made for each other, corresponding, interlocking in every way. So when God made woman, he took the perfect man and he built something even better. And guys, we're what's left over. And I absolutely believe that the most marvelous, amazing creatures that God ever made on planet Earth started with Eve. And what happened when Adam saw Eve? He started writing poetry. Isn't that right? This is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. Now we have a new word, Isha, because she was taken out of man, and here it's not out of Adam, but out of Ish. And now you have one of the terms for men and women, Ish and Isha. We saw the other ones for male and female, Zakar and Nekeba. The Bible has a number of binary words for men and women but it's very clear in scripture and there never has been any question in scripture and there really hasn't been much of a question in all of human history as to what a man is or what a woman is even though it seems that very smart people who get elected to very high offices now can't figure out what's what but most four-year-olds can humans are the crowning act of god's creation Women are the crowning act of God's human creation. Woman is the best of the best of God's entire creation. A unique, glorious, mysterious, amazing creature beyond anything else, beyond Adam's, Adam's fondest imagination. Adam is smitten and God intended him to be so. This is a love story. Creation is a love story. Scripture is a love story. Therefore a man, an ish, a male, shall leave his father and mother, there you have the binary, and be joined to his woman. There is no word for wife, by the way. 
It's just his woman and husband is her man. Uh, feminists don't like that, but God doesn't seem to have a problem with it. The man, the Ish, shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his woman, Isha, and they shall become one flesh. What God split in two, he brings back together. Both genders reflect the glory of, glory of God. Each gender reflects it uniquely. But when you get those two back together in a one flesh marriage, you have the glory of God shining on earth brighter than anywhere else. So guess what? Satan wants to take down marriage because he hates the glory of God. Jesus affirms these principles, and we're probably going to have to stop here and turn this into a short series. The Pharisees came to Jesus one day testing him, saying, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? We're not going to talk about that, but they wanted to talk about divorce. I love Jesus' answer. He said to them, have you not read that he who made them in the beginning made them male and female? And said for this reason, so let's see, he made the male, male and female, that's Genesis 1. And he said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his woman, his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That's Genesis 2. I can't figure out how you can believe in Jesus and not believe the literal Genesis 1 and 2. Because that's what Jesus affirms. And if Jesus said it's true, I believe it's true. And then they're no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. They wanted to talk about divorce. They wanted to talk about the problem. Jesus wanted to talk about the glorious original. And I think we need to spend more time thinking about original glory and not so much time about sin. Why? Because God intends to recreate us into the original. In fact, I don't have it on the screen, so open your Bible. I'll close with this, Romans chapter 8 and verse 18. Look it up, Romans 8 and verse 18. Now, we're going to have to spend the second week on this because we've got to talk about what went wrong. And, and how that relates to today and our understanding of, of women and men and gender and a biblical worldview. But I want to close today with this. Have you got it? Romans 8, 18, I want you to see it. For I consider that the sufferings of the present time, anybody discovered their suffering in the present time? You bet. They're not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed, it does not say in the original to us. It says in us. Paul isn't talking about how God's going to reveal himself to us and his glory will overwhelm and wash away all concern with the trouble we've been through. It's talking here about the present sufferings are not worthy to comp be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. Well, let me read the next verse. 19. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons. Sorry for the male-dominated language. The sons and daughters of God. What does verse 19 say? The creation out there is sitting on the edge of their seats with eager anticipation of getting to know us when we once again reflect the full glory of God. Do you see that? We may not think we're worth much, but the entire creation can't wait till God 
fully redeems and restores us, and they get to become friends and companions with the glorious image of God creatures that God is going to restore into his kingdom, and that's the men and women of this earth. Isn't that great? I want you to get that. The creation out there that sees the degradation and the brokenness of this world and how human beings have de been degraded to but a mere shadow of what God intended us to be. And let me tell you, we're not too bad in the shadow stage. We're pretty smart still, but can you imagine what we'd be if we were running on all eight cylinders instead of only one or two? And this verse tells us that God is going to put his glory into us. And the rest of the universe recognizes what we're going to be, and they can't wait till it happens. So get rid of this I'm worthless viewpoint and look at yourself from the standpoint of what God and the rest of the universe sees in you, women, and us, men. They can't wait to get to know us when we've let God fully restore us. Because we will once again be the glorious image of God on earth. We went from original glory to a real train wreck. And God wants to restore the original glory. That's why Satan wants us all confused about who we are where we came from, how we were made. And he especially doesn't want us to understand what the potential of what God intends to make us into when he restores us into the fullness of the image and the likeness and the glory of God. Amen? Amen. So I didn't read any poems about motherhood. And I really didn't get finished with my sermon. So you'll get some more next week. Um, but what I want to say at least to you ladies today is, to you women, to you moms, to you girls, to those in this room today that God has blessed with being a woman, with being female, you bear an aspect of the glory of the image of God that us men, even if we manage to dress up and look like and act like and think we're one of you, we'll never come close. You have a mystique, you have a depth, you have a character potential that Satan doesn't want revealed because it reveals the glory of God in a way that makes him jealous. And men, we ought to be all about trying to nurture the beauty and wonder of our wives and the women in our lives. Instead of trying to control and dominate and think we need to be in charge or things would all go down the tube, God made women capable in ways we'll never come close. And we need to help nurture that capability. Amen? That's what God intends. We're not capable of ruling creation by ourselves. We need both halves together in the image of God in order to once again reflect the amazing glory of God. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for making us. Thank you for making us in your image and after your likeness. Thank you for making us male and female. Thank you for making us equals but different overlapping and intera interlocking. Thank you for splitting the atom into two incredible different genders. And thank you for bringing us back together in biblical marriage where you make us one and your glory shines brighter than ever. Thank you for giving us the privilege and the honor of being able to reproduce little image of God creatures that grow up to be glorious image bearers. May we take time to reflect on a biblical worldview of humanity and gender and children and marriage. 
and take enough time with that 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 can actually be how we look at ourselves and each other, not the way society and an evolutionary secular worldview wants to make us look at each other. May we think about original glory, and may we gaze on you so you can restore us into that glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.